Well, it's so happy to have you with us this evening for uh, Pastor's Corner Bible Study. We always want you to uh, like us and uh, share this with a friend, a relative, acquaintance, or a neighbor. We're just so thankful to the Lord to be here. Thank you for joining us. I uh, hope you catch us on YouTube as well. Uh, you can check out our website and get more information about how you can reach us. It's there, uh, posted, whether you are using YouTube or whether you're using Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. Please chime in too as well, because we'd love to hear from you as well to know who's on the line. Let me just uh, say thank you. I think our Distance Award goes, perhaps as listening to us on Wednesday night, goes to Miss Sister Kathy Boyd from California. We're glad to have you and all of those who are out of state, out of Texas, we're glad to have you as well who live in Texas to live in the community. We're thankful to the Lord for the St. Luke Church for always supporting as you always have done. Now, tonight I want to get away from marching through the miracles for one night, for one Wednesday night and uh, remind us of, of what this season is all about in terms of this pandemic um, and to get our eyes perhaps off of the problem and put our eyes on the solution. And Jesus is the solution to all of our uh, situations. So I want to go to the New Testament tonight in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew's Gospel chapter 26. And I want to read two verses, but I'll actually uh, start at verse 36. But I just simply want to read uh, into your hearing and put a tag on this text on tonight. Uh, this teaching tonight in verse number 54 and verse 55. So turn your Bibles to verse 54 and verse 55 of Matthew chapter 26 as we explain and explore what Matthew records of concerning uh, Jesus' um, experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. Verse 54 says this, But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that must, uh, rather, that thus it must be. Let me read it again, I stumbled. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? In the same hour, said Jesus uh, to the multitudes, are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you laid no hold on me. Verse 56 and I close. But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Uh, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Uh, I'm going to talk about tonight, it's got to happen this way. It's got to happen this way. There's some things in our lives that's got to happen the way they happen. And Gethsemane for Jesus had to happen the exact way it happened because the scriptures foretold of the event of Gethsemane. You remember now Gethsemane, yeah, the Garden of Gethsemane is the place where Jesus prays uh, before he goes to Calvary. He is there with his disciples and he uses this time to be alone with his father, to talk with his father uh, concerning his trials and his imminent death uh, as he goes to Calvary for the remission of all of our sins. The blood was going to be shed for that remission, and then he would pay the ultimate price of his life to save us. And so I want to look at his agony in Gethsemane and remind us that some things, just like Jesus, that have to happen the way they happen. No accident. It's not happenstance. It's not by chance. God, through his permissive will and his ordained will, things, some things have to happen the way they happen. Well, verse 36 says, Jesus is coming with them to a place called Gethsemane. He's going to uh, the place of squeezing. Um, he's going to Gethsemane. Olive trees were there. Uh, and uh, you know that's a place of squeezing. Uh, and, and he says to his disciples, disciples, you sit here while I go yonder and pray. While I go yonder and pray. So what does he do? He takes with him, Peter, James, Peter, the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. He brings all of them into the garden along with him. And he is, his spirit, his heart, 
is sorrowful and very heavy because he knows what's, what's up ahead. Let me ask you a question real quickly. How do you handle crises? How do you handle crises? Jesus is entering into a crisis moment, and we ought to watch how he handles his crises, and we should be able to imitate him in terms of our own crisis as well. So uh, it, is, it, is, it is a crisis he's entering into, and we always have crises in our life. So how do you get um, to the point where you can say, like Jesus, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. We have to get to that point. We have to get to that point. And Jesus got to that point based upon a prior relationship that he has with his, with his father. So he's taking his disciples into the garden and he gives them an assignment. You sit here while I go and pray. You accompanied me so far that I'm going to move a little ways away from you and talk to my father. He takes Peter and the two sons, James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then they said unto him, My soul said unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. So tarry, stay right here, he says, and watch with me. Be alert with me for this season, for this, for this hour. And here's what Jesus does. He goes a little further and falls on his face and prayed uh, these words. O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Not what I want. If there is any other way to save mankind, I'll do it. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Because that's... That's the way the son responds to the father. He does whatever the father tells him to do. He's born that way. And so he says, if there is any other way, I'm with that. If there's no other way, I'm still with you, father. And that's the kind of spirit, that's the kind of attitude we must take in times of crisis. Lord, if it's your will, I'm satisfied with that. Not my will, but thine be done. So if we're going to make it and accept things that happen to us, perhaps on a daily basis or weekly or seasonal basis. Some things in our lives have to happen that way. And so Jesus teaches us, number one, since it has to happen this way, my life, your life, needs to be saturated with prayer. Saturated with prayer. Sit here, he says to his disciples, while I go yonder and pray and pray. Now, he knows what's up ahead. He knows he's going to be arrested. But he doesn't take time to call a lawyer, call protection. No, he doesn't, he doesn't ask to escape. No, he says, this thing is, is heavy. It's the, hit. it's the heaviest thing that I've gone through because I know that there's going to be a time um, on Calvary while my father and I will be distant. I'll be taking on the sins of the world, and my father cannot look upon sin. He cannot look upon sin. So, so he says, this is, this, is, this is sorrowful. This is a time of sorrow and even unto death. So he prays. I cannot emphasize that. Pray before your crisis. Pray as you enter in your crisis. And you want to pray so hard while you're going through your crisis. He says to them, you all stay here at the entrance. I'm going a little further uh, into the garden. Here's what he does. He trusts his father with his life. Therefore, he trusts him with his death. I don't know who I'm talking to tonight. But maybe that's a word for you tonight. You've got to trust God for your life before you trust him with your death. So whether in life or death, you still trust him. And that's basically what Jesus is saying. To trust him, to make sure in life and in death that all of this is in the will of God for my life. So Jesus teaches us 
uh, our lives must be saturated by prayer. But then secondly, our lives need to be separated from self. Separated from self. You know why people worry so much? You know why they worry? It's because they spend so much time talking to themselves. We worry because our thought processes are with with, with ourselves. We speak to ourselves. We think to ourselves. We, we talk about things and imagine things in our mind that probably will not even happen. So we've got to come to a point where we separate ourselves from self. And that's a hard thing to do. I'm not telling you something that's easy. Self-abandonment for the Christian is difficult. You've got to die to yourself. Because the natural self doesn't want crisis, does not want uh, pressure. The, the, the natural person runs from trials and tribulations. So you've got to self-abandon yourself uh, from, from yourself. Um, not only that, you've got to uh, go through what I call people abandonment. You cannot depend on people to get you out of crisis to crisis. That may not be the will of God for your life. And when people don't help you in your time of crisis, then you become mad at the world and mad at everyone because they did not come to your rescue in your crisis. That's because we spend too much time thinking to ourselves and not praying to our Father. Jesus says, I know what's up ahead. Let me saturate my life and saturate this situation with prayer but also let me separate myself from self. Not my will, this is what he says, but thine be done. Look at it. Follow me in verse 39. He goes a little further. Well, Jesus always goes a little further. If you think about your own life and think about what all God has done for you, he has always gone a little bit further. Whatever blessings he gave you with, gave to you last year, look what he's done this year, gone a little bit further. He always goes a little bit further. We don't deserve it, but he does. So he goes a little bit further, falls on his face, and prays. Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup, this experience, this crisis pass from me. But then he uses a word and called nevertheless. Never less than your will. Basically, that's what he's saying. Never less than your will, Father, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Well, he comes back to his disciples, um, and, and right after that moment, comes back to check on them, and guess what? They are asleep. The assignment was, stay right here, watch. Watch. That was the assignment. Sit here while I go yonder and, and pray. You all watch. They could not watch with him for one hour. One hour. They are asleep. Peter says, what could you not watch with me? A one hour? One, one hour. Not necessarily 60 minutes, but during this hour. During this season of crisis, during this season where the test is coming, they go to sleep on Jesus. So he says in verse number 41, watch and pray. Watch and pray. That's a word for us tonight. Watch and pray. Since we cannot go anywhere, since we cannot do very much, just watch, just pray. That's what he says do that you enter not into temptation. That See, temptation is, is a sneaky thing. It, it is temptation disguises itself sometimes in activities. Let me just do something. If I just do anything, I think I'll be happy about it. And therefore, temptation takes a hold of our lives and gets us to go in the wrong direction when you are tempted. So the, the, the model prayer that Jesus says for us in Matthew, lead us not into temptation. 
but deliver us from evil. Deliver us from, from all evil. So he, he says, um, watch and pray that you don't go into temptation, disciples. And then he says, the spirit is indeed willing. I know your heart, but your flesh is weak. Now, don't use that as a, as a, as a rationale for doing whatever you want to do. The flesh is weak. Don't use that as, as an excuse. That's just a human fact. That in, in our flesh, in our self, we can never please God. Because the flesh has built in weaknesses to it. You don't have to create any more weaknesses for yourself. The human, humanity has enough built in weaknesses uh, for humanity. So he says the flesh is weak. So here's what Jesus does. He goes away again the second time. And he does exactly the same thing he did the first time. He doesn't change. He doesn't change his methodology, his MO. He goes back to talking to his father. He's not talking to himself. He's talking to his father, to his father. Again, we spend a whole lot of time talking to ourselves in the, in the presence of the father. It's like, it's almost as if there are three people, you um, and your mind and yourself and Jesus are in one room. And you and your mind have a dialogue and a conversation going on and Jesus is, is never allowed to say anything. And he's in your presence. He's there waiting for someone to talk to him. But we spend a lot of time telling ourselves uh, things that we ought to be telling the Lord. Well, he's, the Bible says in verse 42, here's what he prays this time. Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, he says, except I drink it, your will be done. Something's got to happen that way and happen this way. Can you say that these things that have happened to you, Lord, if it's your will for my life, let it be done. As distasteful and as hard as some situations have been in our lives, we still have to say the same thing that Jesus says. If, if it doesn't pass away, if it's right there when I wake up in the morning, or if it's there when I wake up the next morning and the next morning after that, I'm still cool with that. I'm still okay because this must be the will of the Father. And whatever his will is, he will always be his bill. He'll pay for it. He, he always pays his way. And so he says, thy will be done. Jesus says the most important thing in his life, and should be in ours, is, to, is that the Father's will be done. So he goes right back to the disciples. Guess what? In verse 43, he finds them sleep again. Sleep again, for the eyes were heavy. Well, we can't talk too much about the disciples in that situation because uh, we'd have to bring up our record. We tend to, to go to sleep on the Lord as well. So they went to, they went to sleep again. Their eyes were heavy. This time, Jesus leaves them alone and went away. The Bible says he goes right back into prayer the third time. Doesn't complain about the disciples going to sleep on him. He goes back and talks to the Father the third time and uh, saying the same words. So between the first prayer and the second prayer, he's into the third prayer now. And he says the same thing. He doesn't change. No, 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 no. He doesn't move. He doesn't move off the spot. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, you got to pray the same prayer until you get your answer. Pray the same one until you get your answer. So he comes back, says to the disciples, sleep on, take your rest. The hour is here that the Son of Man, that's his name now, Son of Man, uh, is betrayed in the hands of sinners. Soldiers were coming to arrest him in that garden. So he says in verse 46, Arise, let's be going. 
because he is at hand that doth betray me. Judas had um, brought the soldiers with him that were going to be arresting him. He is the betrayer. So first of all, let me review. You need a, if you, to handle things as the way they are, knowing they're going to happen this way. Your life needs to be saturated by prayer, separated from self. Here's the third one, and I don't have time to really finish, but we'll hopefully finish at another time. Our lives must be situated in faith. Situated in faith. Go to verse 47. Situated in faith. And while he had spoke, Judas, one of the twelve, came with a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders. Judas is there, and he gives us the information about who came with him. The betrayer comes, uh, the, the multitude with coming with him with, with swords and lanterns and the chief, chief priests and elders, church folk were coming as well. And, uh, of course, Judas kisses Jesus as a sign of who, who Jesus really is. He points him out and says, Arrest him, hold him, hold him. And forthwith he came to Jesus. Now these arresting officers, they do not put their, their knee on Jesus' neck. I just thought I'd throw that in there. They do not do that. These arresting officers, they don't put their knee on the neck of the Savior. Because Jesus is in control of his own life. And he's in control of his own death. So they arrest him. They hold him. And um, forthwith he came to Jesus and said to him, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And you know the rest of the story. How they laid hands on him. They took him and um, stretched out his hand. Peter Peter sees that, takes out his sword, and uh, swings it at the at the high priest's servant, um, and uh, cuts his ear off. And Jesus says, "No, Peter, I really don't need a sword in this crisis. I'm not looking for escape, and I, I'm not going to look for bail bondsmen. I'm not going to look for any of that, because this that I'm going through now has to happen this way." So he heals the man's ear and um, puts it back on his head, healed him, and says to Peter, put your sword up. I didn't come here for that. I came here for this. And the scripture says, as I read, then the scriptures must be fulfilled, and thus it must be. It had to happen this way. Our Savior had to be arrested. He had to go to court. Six different trials. He had It had to happen that way. The scriptures said it so. It was prophesied. Not one thing could be changed. No, brothers and sisters, it had to happen this way. The Bible says uh, Jesus is arrested, but all this was done. All this was done that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Prophets had already prophesied it. It had already been recorded, and this had to happen this way. And all the disciples forsook him and ran, but that too had to happen this way. Jesus had to die for sinners alone with no help from his friends. Now, the reason for that, it had to happen this way, is that your salvation and mine was on the line. You could not be saved if it hadn't happened this way. Jesus hadn't died on the cross, because that's where he went that Friday. He went to the cross to die for you. It had to happen that way. They buried him in a borrowed grave, Joseph of Arimathea's grave. It had to happen that way. Three days and three nights in the grave, and he rose out of that tomb. It had to happen this way. He's coming back again because it has to happen that way. My friends, listen, you need
need Jesus more than you think you need him. So if you're without Christ tonight, I encourage you, let him into your heart. And he would have done all of what he did in Gethsemane if you were the only one ever born. He would have died for you. He would have been crucified for you, buried, and the third day morning, get up out of that grave that you might be justified before your father. Well, I hope you'll read it again. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. I'm out of time, but I hope and pray that you'll join us again in the pastor's corner.